Hello and welcome to Comic Culture. I'm Terrence Dollard, a professor in the Department of Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. My guest today is writer, artist, publisher, J. David Spurlock. David, welcome back to Comic Culture. Thank you, Terrence. It's very nice to be here. So, David, you have written a, a new book about the artist Frank Frazetta, and I'm wondering, for those who might not know uh, the immense talent of Frazetta, if you could tell us a little bit about who the man was. Well, actually, I have two new books on Frazetta. One, one is about a year and a half old, fantastic paintings of Frazetta, and the new one is Frazetta book cover art, the definitive reference that just came out, hot off the press. Uh, sometimes I'll say barbarians, beasts, and beauties it would be one of the quickest ways to try to put uh, Frazetta genres into a nutshell. Some people want to say science fiction, and he did science fiction, but actually what he did the most of I would say more accurately is described as heroic fantasy. Things like Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, Conan, John Carter of Mars. Now, John Carter of Mars is kind of a hybrid of fantasy and science fiction. Perfectly fine. But all of those people will be most familiar with those movies. And Frazetta did influence those. So if you appreciate that type of material, heroic fantasy, maybe with a little romantic or a little science fiction twist, occasionally like John Carter or Mars, you know, there's there's Frazetta in that DNA for sure. But he goes he goes back to first made it really big, started in comics in the late 40s, went into newspaper strips in the early by the early 50s, did a little bit for EC with some of his close friends like Al Williamson. But the big shift was in the mid 60s when he started doing uh, painted paperback book covers. And that's when we start getting uh, Tarzan, John Carter on Mars, and then the Conan series. Conan had been around since the 30s and was known as kind of a little niche of heroic fantasy, strange stories from uh, weird tales, pulps originally. But it was the Frazetta covers that turned Conan into a, a really big hit in the 60s which inspired Marvel to do a Conan comic book and the combination of the Frazetta covered paperbacks and then the series of the, the Marvel did together inspired the movie with Schwarzenegger. And it's fascinating because he's one of these artists that even if you don't know the name, you know the image. And uh, I'm thinking of the one, it's the, uh, the barbarian on the horse. Death Dealer. Death Dealer. And that's one of the most famous images that you see in heroic fiction, like you're saying. But those who don't read heroic fiction know this image. So he becomes uh, somebody who uh, sort of transcends the, the genre that he's working in. Some of the ways that Frazetta exploded past just the book covers, even though that was the venue that gave him his initial explosion, though he had been in the business through comic books in the 50s, was uh, some of the pieces uh, were used as rock album covers, including Molly Hatchet. Frank actually got a couple of gold record awards for Molly Hatchet covers, and the Death Dealer piece ran as one of those Molly Hatchet covers. Nazareth also had a, a Frazetta cover to and these were these bands were big in the uh, late seventies, early eighties, and also there was a huge uh, fad, at least nationwide, in custom vans. And your custom van wasn't really complete unless you had a painting on the exterior. And there was no artist that got imitated more than Frazetta. Uh, in fact, I'd really like to do a book if I could find them. There's probably a lot of custom bands now in wrecking yards now, or if I could get high res photos, even though it's not actual Frazetta work, it's people imitating, usually with airbrush, imitating Frazetta. Uh, but uh, now and then online, some photos will pop up, you know, of some uh, vintage photos of custom bands with Frazetta imitations on there. And there was a magazine on custom bands in the middle of that craze. And they actually interviewed Frazetta. Frazetta did few interviews. And you could tell by reading it almost between the lines that he was hesitant because, and he finally came out and said it, you know, they expected him to be very enthusiastic. And even though it's like, hey, there's pseudo Frazetta riding down highways all across America. He's like, well, you know, it's people kind of ripping off my art. You know, it's not really my art. And I'm not getting paid to do those jobs. I forget exactly what he said, but he finally came out with that that bit of it. But so yeah, those between the the some of the rock album covers, the like gold 
record ones, those sold like a million copies, two million copies. The paperback books were selling more like a, a quarter of a million, you know, 200, 250,000, maybe uh, 300,000. Uh, on the top upside, on the lower side, it'd be about 100,000, 100,000 to 300,000, depending on what the book was. So that built it and introduced him to a lot of art directors all over and collectors and fans and people, the broadest uh, swath of life, you know, from bikers to historians, uh, there was something inherent in his, I, I, I want to attribute a, a little bit to his uh, Italian Sicilian bloodline, you know, there's a, and there is a classicism in his work and it was unusual for illustrators in the 60s actually to be working in oils. That's uh, more of a fine art medium. It's problematic for illustration because it takes so long for it to dry. But that was his medium of choice. Uh, he did briefly do some gouache paintings, which was an opaque watercolor that was used primarily by illustrators in the early 60s. But he very quickly went to oils and oil on canvas. And those paintings now, he passed away in 2010, but they were already selling for a million and above before he passed away. And that's unusual for an artist to see his work sell for a million or more within their lifetime. It's amazing because, you know, the, the art market for original comic art has gone uh, crazy in the last few years. It's not uncommon for a piece. I, I know Frank Miller's cover for The Dark Knight Returns, number one, recently sold for over a million dollars. It's just amazing that there's an appreciation for comic art, but the fine art that Frazetta is doing uh, is, uh, I'm imagining that is also uh, seeing that exponential growth in value. Well, particularly Frazetta. I wanted to say, for people who think about this <clears throat> artistic genre, there are many people that came in the wake of his success. And I think for younger generations who, who weren't around to see it happen in the 60s and 70s and into the early 80s, uh, they don't, they may see it as a genre, they may like the genre, they may connect it to things like uh, Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and Conan movies and things like that but they don't realize that it's so much is tied up with this one person, uh, Boris Vallejo, Jeffrey Jones, Ken Kelly, uh, Arthur Sudan, um, many, 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 many artists that came after him that were so influenced by what he did, uh, that, uh, you know, went on to Bernie Wrightson, went on to great careers of their own, but, from a historical standpoint, it's very important for people to realize it started with Frazetta. You could say, well, Frazetta was influenced by how Foster did the Tarzan and, uh, and Prince Valiant newspaper strip, but that was mostly influenced on his pen and ink work. Yeah, he never saw Foster's paintings uh, when he was in his formative years. I published a book on Foster and I gifted a copy to him and he was very moved and people gifted Frank his royalty, his artistic royalty. And people always, you know, anytime someone went to see him, they tend to want to gift him something. And it was very rare for him to really be moved by a gift or want to reciprocate. But he was very moved by that Foster book. And one reason was because for the first time in his life, he's now a, an old man in the waning years of his, his uh, career. And, uh, it was the first time in his life he'd ever seen any Foster paintings, uh, which are pretty rare as opposed to the, the line art, the newspaper strips he saw as a kid. Also, J. Allen St. John, who was the early great Edgar Rice Burroughs illustrator in the 1920s, 1930s, he was an influence on Frazetta. But Frazetta kind of pumped it up. Uh, more sex appeal, more testosterone, more violence. Um, but he it still had this artistic integrity in it. It's like he's pushing the limits. He's testing the barriers. He's going beyond the barriers. Uh, but even people who aren't drawn to those genres, uh, they can see the classicism and the, the uh, I would say that he imbued his work with a, such palpable atmosphere 
that even if the proportions were exaggerated or the creatures were imaginary, he made you believe it through his talent. It's one of those things where you look at the artwork and you don't think of it as commercial art. You think of it as that fine art because there is uh, that sort of approach to it. At least that's what I take from it. And like you say, uh, Frank's influence is, is enormous because I'm thinking of uh, the fact that we wouldn't have franchises like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe without those early Conan covers that sort of mm. inspired that whole uh, new genre. Um, so I'm wondering, what is it about uh, Frazetta's work that inspired you to write not one, not two, but seven books about him? It's, it's unique. It's very unique. I think it's important to recognize the pioneers. It's kind of like someone can start a revolution and then once it's propagated, whatever the change is, it's just very important, you know, as a historian, as a writer who writes on the subject of the history of illustration, comics, fantasy art, uh, who are the important characters? You know, I've, I worked for years with Stranko, uh, with Carmine Infantino, and uh, I head the Wally Wood estate. So it's not like I'm just all about Frazetta, but he's he's one of the top talents to come. In fact, in some ways, in comic book art, most of the masters would agree that the highest form of comic book art is not in the rendering style. It's in the storytelling. It's about the storytelling. And Frazetta's comics, he did not rise to the top as one of the all-time great storytellers. You know, he, you know, you would not compare Frazetta to Will Eisner as a storyteller or, or to Steranko or Wood or to Kirby. But some of the qualities that they had when it came to single images nobody had the, the finesse the dexterity to go to hit you in the gut with one hand and overwhelm you with subtleties in other ways and his ability to render anything in ways that you had never seen it before so it's like he kind of started in comics but then he went larger wasn't that he was looking for that there was not a before Frazetta, there wasn't a clear path from comic book art to newspaper strips to paperback book covers to museums. Frazetta created that path. And now all artists can look back and say, you know, there is a, a little tiny video of Frank Miller on the internet of him being surprised. He comes around a corner and he doesn't know there's some Frazetta originals uh, on the wall. And he's like physically moved and shocked. He's like, how is this here? And then he says, this is the great Frazetta. This is what I as aspired to. And uh, you were talking about the record uh, breaking Frank Miller cover sale. Uh, uh, Frazetta has broken that highest cover original art sale a number of times, um, including the record before the Miller was a Frazetta. And I believe that Frazetta broke it again after that with a, a Death Dealer cover. That Death Dealer cover was originally going to be a paperback book cover, but it ended up not getting used. And years later, it finally ran on a comic cover. So it put it in the running when it sold for a couple million dollars. You know, suddenly it's the new record, uh, comic book cover, original art, uh, uh, another Frazetta record. As a, a scholar, someone who uh, is influencing the world of art, someone who's influenced by the world of art. How do you sort of put together a book uh, about an artist and get into, uh, I guess, a little bit of biography, but also a lot of uh, analysis of their form? You always want to come up with a, a good concept for a book, you know, not uh, just a generality, and especially, you know, Frazetta has been around long enough and there's been enough books that you, you're looking for. The, when I first got a contract to do, to work with Frank and his family on doing, you know, official Frazetta authorized uh, books, the prior publisher, their books were still in print and they had uh, some very significant books. Uh, Icon was one of them, Legacy and Testament. They had a, a trilogy of books 
It had all, pretty much the, the major paintings that most people want, and then some rarities to keep the hardcore diehards uh, interested too, and good information and, and well-produced, good design, good printing. So when I first came in, and even I remember a conversation with Frank and his wife, Ellie, and Ellie was saying, yes, we want you to take over. And then Frank said, but there's nothing left. It's all been done, except for some life drawings, some nude life drawings. And I said, I'd be very happy to publish your nude life drawings, Frank. And so that kind of turned into a, a sketchbook. We didn't do a whole book of the life drawings, but we made it a chapter and we did two volumes of sketchbooks. The vast majority of those pieces had never been published before. A lot of them were prelims for works for oil paintings that, that people do know, but the sketches themselves had never been published before. So that's, we found a way to do something new and different there. And we showed a little different from some sketchbooks is we showed the the previously unpublished piece, the, the preliminary or the sketch. And if it is from a, a known finished piece, we would show that for comparison as well, but we would focus primarily on the previously unpublished piece. Our, our recent Fantastic Paintings of Rosetta book was a big hit and a lot of people got turned on to it. I did that one working very closely with Frank Frazetta Jr. and the Frazetta Museum in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania. We, we hit a broader audience there than we had with the earlier sketchbooks. Some of the comments were, oh, it's great to see all his classic paintings back in print, but we'd like to see some rarities. And, uh, and sometimes social media or wherever we say, well, you should check out our sketchbooks. They're almost all previously unpublished and it would blow their minds. They're like, what? Two whole books of unpublished, previously unpublished Rosetta, you know? So um, different concepts. The the newest one that just came out on book covers, a lot of people don't realize it. They now see these paintings in all types of places and don't realize what was the original version. Another interesting thing about Frank was he got his originals back and he was a, kind of a pioneer in there. Uh, illustrators prior, sometimes they get them back, sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they're more interested in doing the next job and getting paid than worrying about their originals. And a lot of the paintings weren't things that they ever expected to hang in a museum or something like that. But Frank uh, had a lot of faith in his work and a, lot, and a lot of confidence and he did want those paintings back and he got them back. And a lot of times he would work them a little bit more after they've been published on the same painting sometimes very significantly change them. The only way to see the original version now is to look at that first printing. So in the new book, we have, we're focused only on his book cover paintings that he did specifically for book covers. No matter where someone may have seen him since, if it ran on a rock and roll album cover or it ran on a poster or whatever, a lot of times they've seen the updated version and people haven't seen the original version. So we're presenting every one of them in chronological order so you can kind of watch to see if he's evolving as an artist and so that's that's interesting and you can see where he goes from the early gouache paintings into the oils and then there's a hardcover cover paintings as well so that's a new unique concept for the book there is only the book covers as they originally appeared and then the two sketchbooks um we have one that specialized, he's very famous for beautiful women. We have one called the Sensuous Frazetta. There was a short period in the early 60s before he started doing the, the paperback book cover paintings when he was leaving comics. He actually worked with Al Cap on Little Abner and then they split up. A lot of the comics publishers he had worked with in the 50s had gone out of business and he was having trouble briefly finding work and someone had uh, turned him on to uh, a publisher that was doing kind of some cheap cheesecake paperbacks for men. And he'd do about four drawings, ink wash drawings per paperback for that. And so we collected all of those. Those paperbacks now sell for a couple hundred dollars a piece as collectibles. And, and they're hard to find because people don't know what they look like. The covers aren't by Frazetta, but the interiors are. So we collected all of those. And he, around the same time, he did some rare uh, men's uh, magazine illustrations. And we included those. And then he did a lot of movie posters. And a lot of those were, uh, you can see the sensuous quality of all the women in the movie posters were really fabulous. 
And so we collected all that material into one book. So that's called The Sensuous Presenter. So the main thing is first get a good concept that hasn't really been, you know, to, to put it a, a particular perspective on the subject matter that hasn't quite been covered before and cover it uh, better or more than it's ever been covered before. Now, if you're working on a book cover, are you working on a standard size or are all of his pieces going to be different sizes just depending on what his inspiration was? Frank tended to work on fairly inexpensive, what they would call academy or school grade canvas board. Instead of a stretched canvas, it's canvas wrapped around a heavy cardboard and not particularly large size. Sometimes people will imagine paintings that became fabulously important like the Death Dealer or the first Conan painting. They almost expect them because you know, their importance has grown over the years. They expect them to be giant. They're not. They're, they're maybe, you know, uh, a foot and a half by two feet, you know, and, that, and, uh, and most of his paintings are somewhere in that neighborhood. And, uh, but uh, with a nice uh, uh, frame around them, they look really good in the uh, Frazetta Museum in Pennsylvania. And I recommend people go and visit and see some for yourself. After he was doing very, very well, sometimes he would work larger or worked on stretch canvas and sometimes he worked on masonite and he would actually let the texture or color of the masonite show through parts of the painting there's one that's uh, pretty famous called neanderthals it's just like a, a a group of neanderthals coming towards you out of the mist and that one's on masonite and so the speckly texture in the warm rustic burnt umber speckly background color that's the actual mason but uh, one of the largest he did was King Kong. He really liked King Kong. It was the original King Kong film was one of his favorites. And he was supposed to, he was commissioned to do the uh, movie poster for the remake of King Kong for very large jobs like a movie poster. Uh, it's not unusual for a big studio to hire multiple illustrators and you don't know until the end which one they're going to go with. And they did not use Frazetta's. He was very upset about that. But it was used later on, there was a paperback version of the script that was released as a book. But that painting, because it was meant to be a larger poster, he did the painting larger. And there's a photo of Frank and I together in front of that painting. So that, that one's three or four foot tall, whereas most of them are no, you know, two foot tall at the most. As you're putting together this book and you have to deal with some of the images that are, are changed. I mean, the original paintings, you, you said Frank would uh, modify and improve over time. So how do you get quality prints or, of the original that you can include in the book? When we're, when we're presenting it as art or presenting just the art, then other than running the current state, you know, it kind of turns into a bit of archaeology, trying to find a vintage transparency in, in the old technology of printing color images. They would tend to photograph a, a painting as a, a color transparency, and then they would scan that before desktop computer technology, the current technology. So you have that intermediate of the the color instead of like, you know, most people are familiar with like a 35 millimeter slide, that's a transparency. So you'd have a four by five or maybe an eight by 10 color transparency, that'd be higher quality than a, a small 35 millimeter slide. So sometimes we can find something like that. And, you know, over time, the color may have shifted, they may have dust, scratches. It's a meticulous work, cleaning them up, restoring them to their original glory. And, uh, and we've done that work frequently, but in the, the new book, the, in uh, the total intent is to show it perfectly in the historical context as a historic artifact. So we are actually scanning and reproducing the exact published covers. And that's, uh, that's kind of tricky on itself, but that's what we did. And, and most people think we did a very good job. Well, David, they are telling me that we are out of time. If people wanted to find out more about your work on Frank Frazetta, how can they find you on the web? Uh, VanguardPublishing.com or Vanguard Productions on Facebook. David, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to talk with me. It's been a great half hour. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone at home for watching Comic Culture. We will see you again soon.